The starting pitching options for tonight in MLB DFS are shaky, very shaky. There are no guys available for tonight who have a blend of both floor and upside. A lot of guys have one or the other, but no one really has both. And that makes things pretty complicated because ideally we're getting both, but I don't think we can find that for tonight. So our job is to decide Can we tolerate the ceiling place and bank on that ceiling? Or are the odds they get to that ceiling low enough where we should instead go towards a guy who we can feel pretty good about having a solid game? It's a tough dilemma for sure. It's a tough slate, but I think it's one where we should have a pretty good idea of what to expect. So let's dive on in and get you set for Monday night slate of MLB DFS. Welcome on into the solo shot. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com here to break down Monday's six game main slate with lock set for 6 40 p.m. Eastern for tonight. There are a couple rain spots on this slate. The first one is in Cincinnati for the Reds and Diamondbacks. It looks like there is a window to play around first pitch, but it will depend on the timing of the first wave of rain and the timing on the second wave of rain. They might just be kind of wet, so check back on that later if you want bats there. I'm going to operate under the assumption that it plays, but that is not a guarantee for sure tonight. In Cleveland, for the Guardians and the Rangers, the rain looks like it will arrive in the later innings. They should be okay, more so than Cincinnati, but definitely check back on Cincinnati. Again, I think that they'll play, maybe, but not totally sold. We will talk about them in the stacking section, uh, but just make sure if you want to use them, You check back on the weather there. We'll break down the dicey pitching options in just one second. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts because we have MLB podcasts every weekday. We have PGA every Tuesday. Brandon is back for this week. We got NFC. We got NASCAR. We got USC. A lot of good stuff all right here on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. So search for it. Hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. The NBA Finals are in full swing, and so is your chance to score big on FanDuel Sportsbook. Throughout the NBA Finals, FanDuel is giving new customers $200 in free bets, guaranteed, when you place your first $5 bet. Bet the money line, point spreads, player props, and so much more. Plus, you can combine your bets for an even bigger payday with the same game parlay. If you haven't tried FanDuel, now is the perfect time to give it a shot because the only thing sweeter than watching the finals is cashing in on all the action. Make every game feel like Game 7 with FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel, an official partner of the NBA, must be 21 plus and in select states. First online real money wager of at least $5. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable free bets that expire 14 days after receipt. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WHIP-IT. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789 or in West Virginia, hit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Pitching preview for this Monday main slate, Robbie Ray facing the Astros is the highest salary guy in FanDuel. That tells you how risky the slate is. He is $9,500. Christian Javier in that same game is $9,000. Carlos Carrasco, $85. John Gray is $81. That should give you a good idea of how wild this slate is for sure, with Robbie Ray being the highest salary guy. But I've used Ray a lot this year. It has not worked out for the most part. A lot of earned runs and now facing a very good Houston team on the road. For me personally, I don't think this is a spot to use Ray, despite the fact it's it's a weird slate. So I'm personally not going to be there for tonight. This guarantees you will have 10 plus strikeouts and no earned runs, but I think it's a good slate to look elsewhere for once. And Christian Javier is also pretty risky in that same game because he does leave early pretty often. They don't let him go super deep in games, but I do still like him the most of this group. He's facing Seattle and they're a pretty good team. They have a 114 WRC plus against righties, but they're not an overly powerful team, which is a good thing for Javier. Javier threw a lot of sliders in his first start in the rotation this year for the Astros. And he's scaled back on that usage since then. And if we look at the past six outings with fewer sliders, 
he's letting up a 56% fly ball rate. That can get him in a lot of trouble. It's a bit less risky against a lower power team, which is what Seattle is right now. The upside with Javier is pretty good. So he's one of those guys where the ceiling might or the, the ceiling's good despite the fact the floor is not great. Javier has a 32% strikeout rate across that six outing sample. He had nine strikeouts twice, and both those games were at home, which is where he is for tonight. He did face the Mariners back on May 3rd. Only four strikeouts in that game, but no runs, just two hits across five and a third innings. So Javier's definitely not bulletproof. He issued four walks last time out, left after four innings, just 85 pitches. They are okay, uh, pretty yanking him pretty quick, especially if the, the walks jack up the pitch count. But I do think he's the top option here. I would be willing to fade Javier if he's tracking to be extreme chalk, though. So try to get a vibe on where people are on Javier for tonight. And if you think that he's going to be a bit popular, I would be okay pivoting elsewhere because there are a lot of blemishes within his profile. I'm going to put Blake Snell number two for tonight. He's facing the Mets and the returns for Snell so far are pretty mixed. He's had a lot of walks, but a good number of strikeouts too. And I think those strikeouts will put him second on this list. Snell has made three starts thus far. He has walked multiple guys in all of them, but he does have five, seven, and six strikeouts respectively. And he did face some pretty tough teams there. He was up against the Phillies, the Brewers, and the Cardinals who just obliterate lefties. And two of those matchups were on the road, too. Snell, back at home tonight, facing the Mets. They're a pretty solid team, too. 112 WRC plus against lefties, but they will strike out. Got a 22% strikeout rate against them this year, and not a huge walk team. And that walk aspect is huge because Snell has not been efficient with his pitches. He is at 4.77 pitches per plate appearance so far this year. The second highest mark on the slate is 4.28, each guy's most relevant sample. Only three guys are averaging more than four pitches per plate appearance. So Snell is stretched out, but he's just not getting a lot of juice out of 100 pitches relative to what a lot of other guys do. Snell's getting whiffs. He has a 14% swinging strike rate. People are chasing his pitches outside the zone. He's just got to put it in the zone more often. You know, a 36% chase rate doesn't matter as much if you're putting it outside the zone 70% of the time. So it's not fun. I don't feel great about it, but I do think that Snell is next up on our list, especially if you give me a salary discount at $7,500. So it's very risky. I can understand if you don't want, to go, don't want to go here, but for my process for tonight, I think that Snell is the number two option. And for that ceiling, I will definitely be okay going there. Now, for the third slot, I don't have a great read, honestly. I think you could honestly put Hunter Green here. I'm more inclined to stack against him, but you could also sell him as a pitcher, I think, very easily. So I think I'm going to go with Cal Quantrill, even though he is fully opposite of what I typically do at the position. That's because Quantrill is a low strikeout guy. His velocity is up across his past four starts, and that should be a great thing in terms of getting more strikeouts, but... His strikeout rate is still just 16% in that time. He has had no more than five strikeouts in any of those games. These top five strikeouts just once all year in nine starts. So I hate that, but he's effective. Uh, He limits hard contact. He's gone at least six innings in seven straight games, and he's failed to get a quality start just once. In the four starts with the extra velo, Quantrill has pitched into the seventh inning three times out of four. And... Some of those were against very tough teams. The White Sox, the Astros, and the Royals are all low strikeout teams against righties. He did have seven strikeouts against the Padres. So Quantrill is capable of upside. He just doesn't show it all that often. Honestly, with a bunch of guys who can score a lot of points, he's a tough sell because you need multiple people to fail for Quantrill to be a difference maker in that situation. Here, you don't have that. You need a couple guys to stumble, uh, and everybody on this lake could easily fail. Quantrill may have the best floor of anybody because of how good his bat at ball data is. That's why I'm okay using him, even if he's not my typical type. I just think that it's the way the slate breaks down. I'm okay with it. And like a lot of times they'll say, hey, you know, I'm talking about this guy out of obligation to the format of the podcast, not actually going to use him. I actually will use Quantrill. $7,700, $7,700, so he's right above Snell. I think that's a very fair salary for what he's giving you. So I do think Quantrill does enough to actually be a viable pitching option for tonight. He's one I will use on a pretty weird slate. So again, 
I'm probably not going Robbie Ray. Do like Javier. Do like Snell. And then Quantrill, the guy I would consider as a assume all these guys fail kind of situation. Let's move now into stacks. Stacking a bit easier due to the number of shaky pitchers for tonight. Uh, we got Daniel Lynch facing the Blue Jays. They're a very righty heavy team, and Lynch is struggling right now, which means it's a pretty good convergence for stacking. Lynch has had good outings. He's had five plus strikeout, or he's gone five plus innings in three of his nine starts, or five plus shutout innings in three of his nine starts. That's obviously not great for stacking if he can do that to you. But there have been a lot of tough ones in there too. He's let up six earned runs twice, including his most recent timeout. And he's been trying to adjust, trying to figure things out, get in a groove. He's been throwing more changeups across his past six starts, and that's actually pushed things the wrong way for him. His strikeout rate is down to 18% with a 12% walk rate. The bat at ball issues are still not quite as bad as they were, but still pretty bad. And the play discipline stuff is a lot worse. The Blue Jays will put the ball in play. Uh, just a 20% strikeout rate against lefties. They also do walk a bit, so maybe putting the ball in play wasn't the right wording there, but 12% walk rate. And... That's tough against a guy who is issuing a lot of walks. I think they should put a lot of guys on base here, which is a positive for DFS. It's not a great park for hitting in Kansas City, but it is warm. So I think the Jays are the top stack of the night, and they are one that I feel pretty good about. Now, we talked a couple weeks about uh, Santiago Espinal as being a guy who's really growing on me. He hit his fourth home run yesterday. His ISO is up to 151. Against lefties, it's 216, which is... And he almost, almost as many, twice as many walks as strikeouts. Espino's probably going to bat seventh, which is fine by me. I think the entire bottom of that lineup is nice. Matt Chapman not hitting for a lot of power right now, but um, is striking out a lot less than he was earlier on this year. That's a positive for sure. And also like the actual studs in this lineup, the studs on this team, you're going to be able to get to their salaries today because both Snell and Quantrill are so low salaried. So Teoscar, Bichette, Springer, Vlad, all those guys, very easy to get to. And guys, I would like to get to just because of uh, the ability to get to for tonight with how low salaries are at pitcher. Now I mentioned Hunter Green before. He's facing the Diamondbacks and they will strike out. So again, you could use him as your pitcher, but I think I prefer to stack against him. Uh, and I think they're number two for me tonight behind just the Jays. The Diamondbacks hit the ball hard. They have a 203 ISO against righties with a 42% fly ball rate. Their ice, their WRC plus is 107. That accounts for park. So it's not just the fact that they're in a good park. They've been hitting the ball well all year. Green was the perfect version, the fully realized version of himself last week. He had eight strikeouts. That's awesome. But he also let up four runs and left after three and two thirds innings. That is very Hunter Green. He now has six plus strikeouts in all seven games he has started since he started using his slider more often. So six strikeouts, very good. And that's why he's viable as a pitcher. But his ERA is 6.55. He's let up 12 home runs in seven games. He had five and one, three and another. He didn't let up any home runs against the Red Sox, but still got bounced early because of the other stuff. And another tough spot here. I think the Diamondbacks are a legitimately good team. If it were a team with less power, I might be more inclined to use Green as a pitcher, but I think these guys can hit, and that pushes me to stack them here. So the Diamondbacks, to me, number two stack behind the Jays, despite the fact I do think you could use Green as a pitcher as well. I talked about this last week, but Green is really struggling with righties because he can't throw his changeup to them or doesn't throw the changeup to them. So he's just a fastball slider guy against righties, and his fastball is really struggling right now. Now, that's not applicable for most Diamondbacks. They're a very lefty-heavy lineup, but I think that the point for me is Christian Walker is going to be, I would say, the priority within this team, potentially. Like, maybe number one in terms of, like, guys you want to build around on this team. So... Christian Walker, to me, the main benefactor of this matchup with Green, $3,200, really good power, even against righties so far this year. So I would say Walker is the building block. Then he mix in all the lefties and switch hitters throughout the rest of the lineup. I do think our third stack should come from that same game. So again, that's why it's important to check the weather here. I want to make sure this game plays. I'll go through some other options and things to watch in case that game looks pretty shaky from a rain perspective. That third stack is the, the Reds against Madison Bumgarner. And if you're a regular listener, you know we've tried stacking against Bumgarner a bunch this year. And it is starting to work at times. 
Bumgarner's most relevant sample is his past seven starts. He's throwing more changeups in that time, and he has gone deep in games, but his ERA is 4.46. His skill interactive ERA is 4.56. So he is no longer outperforming his peripherals the way that he did to start the year. And the advanced numbers are still very much what we want. He has a 16% strikeout rate with a 5% walk rate. That means there are a lot of balls in play. About uh, 79% of his plate appearances result in the ball in play. And 50% of those balls in play are hard hit. The fly ball rate, 46%. Bum Garner's led up eight home runs in those seven starts. And three of those came to the Dodgers, who do have a good number of lefties in their lineup. Now, he's pitching in a hitter-friendly park. He does at home, too, but he's on the road. The Reds obviously are not great against anyone, but, you know, against lefties, a 94 WRC+, plus, a lot of strikeouts. So they're not great, but they're also not terrible. And they have some righties who are pretty solid. So it might bite me again to stack against Bumgarner, but it hasn't really bit me recently. So I do think they are the third best option on this slate, just gunning for, you know, a couple solo home runs and stuff like that. I think that on the slate, this would work pretty well. The guy who gets the biggest boost against the lefty is Kyle Farmer. All five home runs for him this year have come with the platoon advantage. He had a 221 ISO against lefties last year as well, if you want to expand that sample. His batted ball numbers are awesome. So are his plate discipline numbers. So Farmer's not low salary to $3,300, but again, I don't think it matters on this slate given how low salary the pitching is. So I'm good with being high on Farmer given the matchup given the platoon advantage, given what he's done against lefties. Again, salary mismatch from what you would expect, but still think he's a good option for today. So top stacks for me will be the Jays, the Diamondbacks, and the Reds in that order. Let's talk about uh, things to watch. We'll go through some other options for stacking right now. Some of them could be um, the Angels. They'd probably be my primary alternative in case things wind up getting wonky in Cincinnati. Angels facing Michael Waka, who's doing a good job of suppressing hard contact right now, but he's still letting up a lot of balls in play. That could be an issue eventually, so I don't mind them. Obviously, the offense is slumping right now. Even Mike Trout's having some issues, so they're not the, the powerhouse I thought they were earlier on this year from a stacking perspective, but maybe that means they're a buy low spot. So the Angels, to me, would be the top alternative if Cincinnati cannot go. I could also see stacking the other side of that game. The Red Sox are facing Noah Syndergaard, and the velocity for Syndergaard has been down recently, and he's gotten beaten up in two of his past four starts with that velocity being down. But both those bad starts for Syndergaard came on the road. He's at home now. I still think you can get there, but there are some risks for sure. So I would say check on that one. Um, maybe you like stacking the Angels, the Red Sox more than I do, but I think they're both in play, but would prefer to go with that Cincinnati game if it is available to me from a weather perspective. Let's talk about John Gray quickly here. I do like what he's been doing recently. Just don't like his matchup. Um, he's facing the Guardians, who have a 16% strikeout rate against righties. My numbers do like Gray. Um, I feel like from an, a talent perspective, they still have him for 5.8 strikeouts, which I think is actually not that bad for this slate. But it would be a lot higher if not for the matchup. Um, so I would say Gray is available, especially if you don't like Quantrill. I'd prefer Quantrill, though, personally. So Gray would be an alternative if you don't want to go with one of the top three guys I discussed or if you want to add a fourth pitcher because of the chaos, stuff like that. For me, personally, I probably won't get there due to the matchup, but I do think that he is at least worth discussing in part for today. Let's finish up with some digger calls. I usually try not to go with two guys in the same team, but given the rain situation in Cincinnati, I kind of feel like I probably should just stick to the Jays for both the boring one and the fun one. The boring one will be George Springer. Um, he's just been hitting the ball well overall this year, hitting the ball well against lefties. He's had more loft than Vlad has had, which is why I want to go Springer over Vlad. So the boring home run call for me will be George Springer. The fun one, I'm going to go with Matt Chapman. Uh, did hit a home run yesterday. He's up to now seven this year. The barrel rate seems to be getting better. Hard hit rate hanging around around 51, 52%. As mentioned before, the strikeouts have been down a bit. I think it's possible he's exchanging like strikeouts for um, power because the power has not been there with the strikeouts being down. But again, did did go deep yesterday, so 
I don't know. I like Matt Chapman in general. Um, I've always had a, an inclination towards him. Maybe this is just like wishful thinking, but I do think that there is a lot of power in that bat still. So the the boring or the home run calls for today, George Springer and Matt Chapman. We'll see if the Jays can take advantage of Daniel Lynch. That is all that we have here for today on the Solo Shop. But once again, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts and like what you hear. Leave us a rating and review as well. If you have any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your MLB DFS lineups. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to get you set for Tuesday Slate. This has been the solo shot right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.